And so I'd like to um, explore these questions uh, with you. Um, as we've done in a previous two series uh, sessions, um, I'll pause periodically and we'll set up a meeting room. I think Terry is going to take, take the meeting room uh, organization in this session. Uh, and you'll have time to get together with colleagues to share ideas, summarize um, your reaction to some of the techniques I suggest, uh, share what you've been doing along these uh, lines. And if there are questions that come up, um, feel free to bring those up within your group, uh, as well as always enter those in the chat box. So that's an open uh, invitation. So let me uh, jump right into this. Um, if you were in the previous sessions, you recall that I presented or proposed that we can think about three interrelated but not identical types of goals for learning. There's acquisition goals, i.e. the knowledge and skills we want students to acquire. But there's also goals of understanding because you can know something without really understanding it deeply. Um, and understanding focuses on those larger transferable concepts and processes. Uh, and finally, we have transfer, the ability to take what you've learned and be able to apply it to new and even unpredictable situations or circumstances. Um, and I made the point that the distinction among these goals matter for teaching, for learning, and for assessment. With a focus today on teaching, um, let me summarize what I believe are the instructional or teaching implications of these three different goal types. And I apologize, this, this is a dense slide with lots of text, but I hope the summary will make sense. When acquisition is our main goal, in other words, we want students to learn and remember information, then the teacher's role is often and appropriately one of direct instruction. We're the experts, we're proficient in skills, we're presenting and teaching uh, to students using uh, familiar methods, including lecture, uh, modeling, uh, you know, presentation modes of various sorts, including having students read uh, materials, be they textbooks or lecture notes. My contention is, however, when we want students to really develop a deep understanding, we've got to do more than just give information to them. We've got to engage students in active meaning making. Understanding must be earned and it must be by, earned by the student. And so the instructional methods that support and encourage active meaning making uh, are methods like Socratic seminar and Socratic questioning. Concept attainment, if you remember, I looked at that as a teaching technique, I think in our first session. Presenting students with essential questions and, and coming back again and again to those questions. Playing devil's advocate, et cetera. And there are a number of other techniques, and I'll show you a few today, that I believe engage students in active meaning making. When our fundamental role is transfer, i.e. preparing students not only to give back information, but to apply it and be able to apply it in new situations, which I call transfer, then I think our methods for, for promoting transfer are more like a coach, if you will, where we're giving the learner feedback, we're giving them new situations and watching how they perform. And those of you that work in clinical settings know that this is the norm uh, in those, those settings where students are confronting real world problems and situations and in your case, patients, um, and they have to figure out each situation, each, each condition, uh, et cetera. So I, I think you know by now my orientation is if we really want deep and lasting learning, our teaching needs to do more than just transmit information or in the metaphor of pouring information into the empty vessel of, of students. That we need to engage students in active meaning making. That this is the way that they develop and deepen their understanding. And we know from memory research, uh, produce memories into the long-term system as opposed to short-term memory, which quickly fades. So I have a recent book 
written with a colleague, uh, Dr. Harvey Silver, in which we talk about teaching techniques that promotes active meaning making, resulting in deeper learning. Um, and this book is based around um, a set of seven key skills. Uh, and we have associated tools for those skills. Um, and in this short session, I want to highlight at least briefly three skills that I think are particularly um, well suited to university teaching and learning. And I hope that by the end of our uh, less than hour now, that you'll find some, some techniques that will be practical and that you think will fit uh, your teaching style, but more importantly, really engage students in meaning making for deeper learning. So I'm gonna look at uh, note making and summarizing as one technique. Uh, one technique that I refer to as reading for meaning, and then the use of visual and graphic representation as not only an organizer that the teacher could use up front, but as a process for students to make meaning of text and all, or, or of content, and also to demonstrate their learning uh, in a way that can be assessed. Um, by the way, I will be sending, um, following our session, um, a PDF file of the main slides I'm using, so you'll have that information. I also have three articles that are uh, directly related to uh, this session that I hope you'll find interesting and feel free to not only read those, but to share them if there are other colleagues you think would be of interest. So let me begin with the first of these uh, skill areas, summarizing and note-taking. And the slide on the screen comes from work done by Dr. Robert Marzano, who's a researcher. And Marzano conducted meta-analyses of teaching methods and purported to identify the effect sizes or the impact on learning that these various teaching techniques um, result in. And this is a rank ordered list of the most prominent teaching techniques that, that he um, advocates. And you can see summarizing and note-taking is right up near the top. And this is something we know from multiple sources that students who are able to take notes actively make meaning from the notes they take and are able to synthesize and summarize key ideas from presentations or from readings are just more effective. Their learning is deeper, it's reflected on assessments and so forth. So this is straightforward. Let's take a look at what all this means and some techniques and tools to support it. In our book, we distinguish note making from note taking, and I'll get into that in a moment. The key difference to me is that note making requires active meaning making, active processing of information, not just recording. Similarly, summarizing is more than just copying. Summarizing is an active process of focusing and prioritizing the most important ideas uh, within a lecture or reading from a text or viewing a presentation. Now, um, have a look at the screen. You don't have to read all the words in the box, but notice the outlining. This comes from a student who is outlining a section from a textbook. You see any problem with this? Well, imagine that we change the color of the outline from yellow to black. And then what we would have might look like a CIA redacted uh, policy brief. In other words, we, we can potentially obscure the big ideas by just kind of blindly or, or mindlessly highlighting. And yet th this is a process that students often do uh, when they're, in this case, reading textbooks. To me, the problem is, is evident or often evident um, when students just kind of mindlessly highlight, especially if they do large amounts of text. In this example, you, you can recognize there's really no prioritizing of content evident. 
they're almost highlighting everything. The student hasn't summarized or synthesized any of the big ideas or put the, the, the content in their own words, which is one of the ways we make meaning. And it's unlikely that the student is going to remember a great deal or really understand a lot from this particular technique. Now, in preparing for the session today, um, I recall, I remember that, that I have retained, saved some textbooks from my own uh, college days, which is now more than 50 years ago. And um, I remember my own, quote, note-taking or note-making, not note-making, note-taking, uh, especially when I was uh, reading textbooks. And so I, I went up and I found three textbooks from my undergraduate days at the College of William and Mary. And I uh, photographed a few of them. Uh, and this is, this is true confessions and, and quite embarrassing, but it's, it's honest. This was a page from my uh, biology uh, course a textbook. And you can see, I, I thought the whole section was important and highlighted a good number of the words. Uh, this is from a psychology course that I took. <laughs> and, you know, I did the equivalent of what the previous student did, but I, I don't re recall having colored highlighters in the initial uh, years of my college, but I remember they came out my senior year and I, I was really excited. And so here's my third example from a history course where I had both yellow highlighter and red pen. And so I did double outlining, which, which I thought was uh, quite effective. But in reality, it's, it's pretty sad. And um, it was not an effective technique for me. So that's my true confession. You're the first people that have seen this in uh, 50 <laughs> years, uh, by the way. So, so let us look at this idea of note making versus note taking and alternatives to my inadequate and, and ineffect, ineffective method. Many of you, I know, teach lecture courses. There's a lot of material and you're presenting it to students, but it's not about what we present or what we teach as much as it is what they get from our teaching. And this is where active processing of information is really required. My experience too often is in high school, college, and even graduate courses, students in lecture presentations are often functioning like court stenographers. They're trying to capture every word, but they're not processing the information, they're just recording. And it, and it, it could be almost like a cranial bypass. So, I like to distinguish note-taking, which is often passive, a, a kind of a stenographer's approach just to copying information or trying to record it, um, resulting in a set of notes that, that aren't really doing anything with the information. In our book, we describe the process of note-making as a much more active process where information is prioritized summarized, translated into the learner's own words, uh, and then revisited actively with further note making. Let me show you just a few illustrations of, of this process. Um, and by the way, my contention is that many students come into university never having been taught these kinds of information processing skills, note making uh, one of them. And that it's really critical that they have these skills to make the most of the courses that you're offering. So here's an example of a more active note making process off of a textbook. And you don't have to read all the words just to see what this student has done. They have highlighted important details, not just by underlining them, but by note making them in the margin in their own writing. They've identified big ideas or key concepts that jump out. These are the ones that you really want to understand. They've raised questions as they're reading, which is something we know that good comprehenders do. 
Interestingly, they even record their feelings or their thoughts in reaction to what they've read. And in this case, this student has made two connections to other, either other information in the course and or connection to their own life or something contemporary. This is the active process of, of note making that we describe and, and we encourage. Now I'm gonna show you a practical tool that you can share with students for doing this. We call it window notes. And it involves students in actively processing information. And it could be from a textbook or it could be periodically from a lecture where you, where you pause uh, and let them record their window notes. In a nutshell, uh, it, when we actually have a graphic organizer for this, there are four lenses, if you will, that students are asked to process information or to use in their note making. Highlighting the key facts and important concepts, raising questions about the content, exploring or listing any feelings that they have, because we know that learning, there's an emotional component to learning. The amygdala is the emotional filter in the brain. And sometimes memories are, are actually deepened when we can connect feelings or affect with content and asking the learner to, to try to forge either connections that they see or think about new connections. Uh, and so that's how the window notes kind of function. Here are just a couple of examples of students who have used window notes. Um, and these are not from university level, these are from uh, K-12. Uh, but I hope the ideas are, or the examples are illustrative. Um, this is uh, a case where students are reading information about hummingbirds, and this student has used window notes to identify uh, some of the facts about hummingbirds, including the fact that hummingbirds are the only bird that can hover and, and kind of stay in place in the air. Questions. How can they fly upside down and backwards? How come other birds don't hover like the hummingbird? Uh, connections. Um, it's probably that a hummingbird is more like a bee, as this one connection the student has made. Um, and then feelings. It must be cool flying upside down when I mean, nobody else can do that or no other animals can do that. So this is just an example. And you can see it's much more active in the processing of the content. Here's one more example. In this case, a student using window notes to unpack and react to the classic a poem, The Caged Bird by Maya Angelou. There are, there, is, there are factual information or facts in the poem. I love the question, is the caged bird actually triumphant in the end? Feelings are, are important in a, in a work like this. Uh, and the connection, this student sees the poetic techniques as cinematic, like in movies where they cut back and forth between two characters. A really interesting uh, observation. Now, we've used window notes um, and, and see that it's especially useful for, for, for informative text or lecture, but it can be used in literature and in history and so on. For those of you in, in uh, math and science, you might say this doesn't quite seem to fit, but we actually have a, a, a related tool called Math Notes. And I'll show you a quick example before we have a, a meeting room pause for your conversations. Um, math Notes is again meant to engage students in more active analysis of problems um, and Take time to try to understand the problem prompted by questions like what's known, what's missing, what question do you have about this? How might we represent visually or graphically the problem domain? Th these are the things that active problem solvers do. 
as opposed to uh, less effective problem solvers tend to try to rush right into a, pro to a solution, often without fully understanding the problem or, or thinking about the problem space. So here is an example, oops, where to go? Here's an example of a student's use of uh, window notes for mathematics. Notice, notice the categories are a little bit different. Uh, starting with what are the facts? What information are you given? Um, what exactly is the problem? What questions do you have to answer? Um, how might we represent the problem? I found as a personal uh, observation and, and notice with many students, being able to graphically or visually represent a problem set uh, can help them grasp the problem and also see potential solution. What are some steps we can take to try to solve this problem? And this also is where heuristics uh, can be brought into play. Things like break the problem down into smaller chunks or find a similar problem and think about how that was solved. Uh, and then finally, there's a place to actually play out a solution and, and show your work. So um, again, I'm hoping those of you in the math, science, technology arena might find some useful elements. You could customize uh, a set of uh, notes, if you will, uh, for, your, for your course. All right, I'm gonna stop talking at you and ask Terry if he would set up our first meeting room. We're gonna have five minutes now for you to discuss what you've heard, including sharing your reaction to my uh, sad examples of, of note taking, describe or discuss my conception of note making, and you might wanna comment on window notes as a particular tool.
Okay, thanks to Terry for setting up the meeting room. I think um, most people are coming back. Is that the case? Yeah, they're coming back. Um, so. Everybody should be back now. Okay, uh, welcome back everyone. Uh, I'm gonna press ahead since our time is short and um, share with you a related technique uh, of simply summarizing. Um, and here's a, here's a subtle, but a worthwhile distinction I'd say. Note making is typically done in process as you're listening, as you're reading, whereas summarizing is an after the fact uh, kind of process. But both of them share, to me, the goal of, of more active processing of information and trying to prioritize, synthesize, and make connections. So in our book, we've um, included a couple of different summarizing tools and techniques. And uh, the one that I find uh, interesting, I wanna share with you, uh, we call 421 Summarize. This is a, both a note taking, note, I'm sorry, note making and summarizing process that is both individual, but also group based. In other words, it's collaborative. And so um, I'm actually going to engage you with your willingness in a little four to one summary exercise, just to give you a sense of how this could work, uh, even in a virtual setting like we have now. So um, watch the screen and you'll, you'll just see how this process works. You would do it in a lecture after, uh, you know, five, eight minutes of presentation or it could be used in conjunction with a video, or it could be done with a reading, you know, not a huge, a huge amount, maybe a short article. Basically, it starts off individually after either listening or reading or viewing, you ask the student to summarize four key ideas that they got from the information. And, you know, you can actually create a little worksheet if, if you're in person or they could do it on a, a Google slide, for, for example. Um, and then you ask them to pair with another student, share their four points, and then together synthesize those into the two most important ideas. And even if you can't read all the text in the, in the graphic on the screen, you'll, you get the idea that um, the third and fourth summary by one student were, were synthesized into one of the two summaries below. Then you get two pairs together. So now we have groups of four and they have to synthesize and summarize to the single, what they consider to be the single most important idea um, that they either heard, read or viewed. Then, and you could do this as a group or you could have, go back to individual, have uh, the student summarize the, the key points in a paragraph. So you're, you're taking a body of information, you're culling it down to get at the bigger ideas, putting it in your own words, summarizing it, but then stepping back and uh, synthesizing. So that's the, the basic process. And you can see that the summaries become the basis for the paragraph. And so the last uh, single summary could be the topic uh, header or topic sentence. And then some of the details are derived from the other summaries. So this again is a more active process of engaging the learner um, in making meaning. Here's a completed example, uh, again, on a content topic around the gold rush. Taking individual bits of information, identifying which are the most important, and then summarizing those as a way of uh, synthesizing information and summarizing it. So that's the basic idea. Now, I thought it would be interesting, hopefully, and, and uh, 
illustrative for you to engage in this briefly. Now, because our time is short, I'm not gonna go through the whole process. Um, I'm gonna do a kind of a shorter version, but I hope it'll be interesting to you. I have a short video uh, presenting information on what I think is a very interesting topic. One that I, I, I'm guessing many of you are, are not familiar with. So for most of you, it'll be new information. Uh, I'm gonna ask you to um, do the following. This is a, a, a modified version. Uh, as you watch the video, I'd like you to summarize what for you are four key ideas. This is a short video, less than three, I think it's about three minutes. Um, you can jot those down or type them in. You don't have to put them in the, in the chat box necessarily, just summarize for yourself. And then a summary, and you could just make it a statement, not a whole paragraph. Like what for you would be a, the synthesis of this, of this video? And if you're gonna talk to your spouse or your partner or your friends about what you saw today, like what would be the succinct summary? Uh, and you're gonna have about uh, four minutes for this once we see the video. Then we're gonna get into meeting rooms. And in your meeting rooms, I'll ask you to share your summary, the single summary that you have and listen to the summaries of your, your colleagues. Okay, so that's the process. Here it goes. This is the story of the knocker uppers. And it's not what you think the title might imply. Many old and honorable occupations that no longer exist have their origins deeply rooted in history when people worked many varying trades. Some of these professions are not what historians might consider to be mainstream work. But over the years, these various lines of work have provided interesting stories that can be passed down to future generations. Even before the days of alarm clocks, people still needed to get to work on time. A knocker up, sometimes known as a knocker upper, was a profession in Britain and Ireland that started during and lasted well into the Industrial Revolution and at least as late as the 1920s. A knocker up is a person whose job was to go from house to house in the early morning and wake up workers by tapping on the bedroom window. They used a truncheon or short heavy stick to knock on the client's doors or a long and light stick, often made of bamboo, to reach windows on higher floors. At least one of them used a pea shooter. <laughs> in return, the knocker up would be paid. Most knocker-ups were paid weekly, and these weekly fees were reasonable and usually based on how far the knocker-up had to travel and the time of day the person needed to be awakened. Generally, the job was carried out by elderly men and women, but sometimes police constables supplemented their pay by performing the task during early morning patrols. A large number of people in this profession usually worked in larger industrial centers. The position gained prominence during the first industrial revolution when many people started to work in factories and needed to arrive at the same time. It was the knocker-up's duty to remain at their client's household until they were awoken and out of bed. Larger factories and mills often employed their own knocker-ups to ensure workers made it to work on time. The goal of a knocker-up was to get as many customers as possible and to cover as much ground as possible. For that reason, knocker-ups sometimes exchanged customers with one another. They developed a system to remember which houses needed to be knocked up and at what time. To keep customers straight, knocker-ups often chalked outside their customers' homes with all manner of figures, half past three, quarter till four, five o'clock, and such. Besides displaying the time, the signboards also advertised a knocker-ups business and could be found hanging over the doors of dingy cottages or at the head of a flight of steps, leading to some dark cellar dwelling containing the words, knocking up, done here. However, some neighbors didn't like the early morning noise, and there were reports of some knocker-ups being pelted from windows and having water chucked down at them. This resulted in the adoption of long tapered wands, like fishing rods, sometimes called a snuffer outer, which was also an implement used to extinguish gas lamps at dawn. The advantage of these wands was that the knocker-up could tap, 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 and wake the paying customer rather than non-paying neighbors. 
knocker-ups were popular enough for authors to include some sort of description of them. For instance, Charles Dickens talked briefly about a knocker-up in his book, Sketches by Boz and Great Expectations and numerous weeklies and illustrated monthlies mentioned them at one time or another throughout the Industrial Revolution. One question history has never answered, who woke up the knocker up? For some, it would appear that the technique in most cases was to stay up all night until they had finished their duties. Eventually, around the 1920s, reliable alarm clocks became affordable to the masses, and the knocker upper was no longer needed. Thank you for watching. <laughs> so now you have it, the story of knocker uppers. So, uh, so our time is brief. I'm going to give you three minutes to do your summary. You may, hopefully, we're taking some, uh, making some notes, and then a single summary statement of your. Uh, summary of this uh, information. And if you want to add your thoughts or, or uh, questions, uh, feel free to do that. And then in three minutes, I'll ask Terry to open up meeting rooms where you can share your summaries with uh, your group mates. Okay, I'm going to ask Terry to uh, launch the meeting rooms, knowing the time was brief, um, because our session is, is short. But um, share what you have as a summary uh, when you get into meeting rooms.
So uh, welcome back. I think uh, people are joining, rejoining. I hope you found the video interesting and, and, uh, and especially enjoyed the conversations. I, I love the, the, the discussion in, in the group where I was, uh, that I had joined. Just interesting ways of processing the, the information and some great some connections, great connections and questions, questions uh, uh, made it made offered as well. as well. All right, so in our remaining few minutes, I'm going to skip this. Um, the last idea I want to share with you uh, is one that I, I remember touching on previously, but it's the idea of using visual representations, particularly webbing and mapping kinds of techniques uh, that students can use to, again, review material, make sense of things, actually forge and, and represent different connections to show relationships among concepts, and even to generate new ideas when that's appropriate. Um, so our time is brief, so I'm not gonna do much other than show you some examples. Uh, and I'm gonna start by using webbing to illustrate webbing. So webbing is a technique that can be used a lot of ways, mm -hmm. including making notes visually, it can help students organize information, generate ideas, particularly if they're doing some, some writing or speaking. It can become a study tool where you visually map out a chapter uh, or lecture notes. Um, and here are just a few quick examples from different, uh, for different topic areas. Um, this is one that questions, and you can see this questions were generated off of the the uh, topic, which was building the Great Wall of China, um, and then adding other facts springing off of the key questions. So this is a good way of organizing information and reviewing. Here's a similar idea. This is a student's web generated from a textbook reading. And one of the things that students learn doing this is that the chapter headers and the, and the photographs or, or graphs are noteworthy. Um, and so those themselves are often categorically important. Uh, here is a case of brainstorming ideas. And this is in a K to 12 example where the students were challenged to come up with a way of making 30 pe pe pennies float in water using uh, aluminum foil. Uh, so it's kind of a design thinking exercise. Um, here's an example of reviewing an entire course. Hmm. Now this one you can see was probably done by a graphic design student using a, a template kind of program. But unlike the one I presented to you uh, earlier, in a previous session where the concept map is created by the teacher, which can be very valuable as an advanced organizer, but it, the student is just looking at it. This requires a student to create the organizer. And, and so it's a good review process for the student, but it can also be a, uh, an assessment for you and not necessarily a, 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 an evaluative assessment necessarily. It could be a formative assessment where you ask the student to make a map of, of what they've learned and to show the connections that they see. And, and you can check to see if it's complete uh, and if there are any misconceptions or if they don't understand relationships. Another idea is to have students do an individual map and then compare it with another student or a group and add to it. And so I think I may have shown you this earlier, but here's an individual student web or map, and now a group web that is much more detailed and the interaction among students in creating a more detailed uh, web or map uh, is itself beneficial. We, we learn through others. Vygotsky said, learning is socially mediated. So those are just some, some very practical tools. Um, because our time is winding down, I wanna, wrap up with one quick 
and to me, excellent example, and partly in response to uh, predictable and realistic concerns, especially for those of you uh, at the university level. One reality is all your courses are jammed. There's not enough time and there's too much material in most cases. And for some of you, there's a second reality that at least for some courses, you have large numbers of students in lecture hall settings. And so both of those things kind of mitigate or potentially can mitigate against some of the ideas that I put forth here. But uh, my contention is even when there's a large, large amount of content and we have large numbers of students, that doesn't preclude using some effective meeting making techniques. I wanna wrap up this session with one of my favorite, uh, one of my heroes actually in higher ed, um, a professor named Eric Mazur, who is a professor of physics at Harvard University. If you don't know Mazur, um, check him out, M-A-Z-U-R. He's got articles and videos online and I'm gonna send you one of his articles. But I like to take a look at uh, a short video that he created that summarizes one of his uh, teaching methods in lectures. I call it interactive uh, lecture method. Uh, it's a little bit older video and you'll see in some of the, the footage, but the ideas are right on. Professor Eric Mazur teaches physics at Harvard. Over the years, he discovered that students in his introductory physics course were passing exams without having understood the fundamental concepts he was trying to teach. In response to this problem, Professor Mazur developed a variety of interactive techniques linked to each other in ways that helped his students learn basic concepts far better than before. Requiring students to read, think, and reflect before the lecture is the first step in Professor Mazur's interactive process. He also uses the course website to monitor their learning and communicate with his students. I don't go into the classroom lecturing on what I think they need. No, they tell me what it is that they want me to cover. It was helpful for Professor Mazur to answer those questions that we had. And sometimes like it didn't feel embarrassing at all if he addressed your specific question because the whole thing was anonymous. So the idea is to teach by questioning rather than telling. I will talk a few minutes and then put on the uh, overhead projector a question. And then I tell them, take a minute to think about it. They think about it. And uh, after they've thought about it, I need to get some feedback on their answers. So turn to your neighbor and see if you can convince one another of the correct choice. And B is down. So the force at the bottom would be clockwise. And in a sense, this process, this engagement, this teaching by questioning rather than by telling, forces students to develop these models in the classroom. I think the lectures are really good and it worked out really well, the idea of everyone teaching each other. And we soon realized that, yes, we were picking up the material faster than we had in the previous physics course that we had all taken. You can forget facts, but you cannot forget understanding. And that's actually exactly what I would like to achieve here. I want them to understand the subject so that they know it for the rest of their life. So that was a very brief uh, excerpt, but I hope you got a few of the ideas uh, even from that, that brief video. Um, I'm gonna share with you uh, the article called Twilight of the Lecture. Uh, and again, he has some really elegant and efficient and effective methods um, that you can learn more about through reading and, and video. So I did want to share that uh, with you. Um, I was hoping to have a third breakout room, but um, our time is winding down. So uh, I'm going to wind down, uh, but um, I'm going to do a shameless plug for uh, this book. If you're interested in these techniques, we have many, many others uh, in this book, very practical and very um, specific. Um, and I, I will, in the handout material or the, yeah, the handout and the articles I send, I'll include a link. Um, if you are so inclined and have a, a, a few minutes, I would invite you to just 
put in the chat box just a brief summary of what for, for you were the most interesting or useful ideas from this session. Um, and if you have to go, I understand that. Um, I wanna thank you for participating, most of you for all three sessions and thank the university for sponsoring uh, this session. And um, I will stick around if anyone has particular questions, you can just unmute and we can talk. Otherwise, I uh, wish you well in your work and um, thanks for the opportunity to be with you. Jay, thank you so much for being here for us. We appreciate you. Thank you. I wanted to add that, and I put it in the chat, but if anybody's interested in the book, you can just let Susan or I know. And oh, we'll hi, hi, I just popped in here, but we'll let, we'll purchase the book and then um, for you, and, but just shoot us a quick email and thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Mm -hmm, sure. I'll leave this open as long as uh, you'd like, Jay. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording now. Okay. Again, thanks for your help today, Terry. No problem. Yeah, I would like to thank Terry, too. He had a 10-minute notice. <laughs>